Hey everyone, and welcome back to NeuroSciQ, the best place on YouTube to build your neuroscience IQ. I'm Christina Valcanis, and I'm an undergraduate student at the Diamandis Lab, and I'm here today to educate you on the effects of coffee on the brain. Before we get started with this week's video, make sure you go ahead and subscribe and turn on notifications so that you can get notified every time we post a video. And before you know it, you'll be able to call yourself a self-proclaimed neuroscientist. Also, make sure to give this video a thumbs up so we can have your support and continue making future videos. Another note, this week in our lab, we have some new exciting news, and that is that we have our own Instagram account. So also be sure to follow us up on Instagram at diamandis.2. So sit tight, because in the next few minutes, I'm going to educate you on just how coffee abolishes drowsiness. And the next time you grab a coffee with a friend, or sip on an energy drink to get you through a long night of studying, you'll know exactly what's going on. With that being said, let's take it to the drawing board. As I already mentioned before, in today's video, we are going to talk about something that has probably already affected you in your life, probably on a day-to-day -day basis, and that is caffeine. It's in tea, it's in chocolate, and of course, it's in coffee. You're probably familiar with the effects of caffeine, either from personal experiences or just from growing up in a caffeine-fueled society. At the end of the day, it's common knowledge for pretty much everyone that caffeine serves us one main purpose, and that is it wakes you up. First off, let's take a look at the chemical structure of caffeine. It's quite similar to the structure of adenosine, a natural molecule that circulates through our bodies. Adenosine is a purine nitrogenous base, much like the bases found in our DNA, adenine, and guanine. Adenosine is the molecule responsible for our feelings of drowsiness. It acts on four different transmembrane G-protein coupled receptors. Each of these G-protein coupled receptors comes from their own gene within our DNA. These are the A1, A2A, A2B, and A3 receptors. Of importance for today's video are the A1 and A2A receptors because these receptors also bind caffeine. If you recall from last week's video, some neurons are excitatory and others are inhibitory. The neurons that the A1 receptors are found on are excitatory and the neurons that the A2 receptors are found on are inhibitory. What I mean by that is that the A1 receptors are found on neurons that cause wakefulness and the A2A receptors are found on neurons that cause us to feel drowsy. With that being said, since adenosine causes feelings of drowsiness, adenosine would inhibit the A1 neurons by binding the A1 receptor and excite the A2A neurons by binding the A2A receptors. The A1 receptor is found on neurons that keep us awake. When adenosine binds these receptors, it prevents their action, and thus we no longer feel awake. The A2A receptors are found on neurons, which are responsible for our feelings of fatigue. And so when adenosine binds these receptors, it makes us feel more tired by activating these neurons. Regardless of which adenosine receptor is being activated, seeing as though they're all G-protein coupled receptors, they lead to something called a cascade, which is amplification of the signal due to activation of secondary messenger proteins. These signals are responsible for stage 3 and stage 4 of sleep, which is known as slow wave sleep. Now, to understand how caffeine plays a role in all of this, it's important to understand the basic neural mechanisms of sleep. One of the most popular methods to study sleep is by using an EEG, which is an electroencephalogram. This basically just takes recordings of the electrical activity on the surface of your brain and ends up computing different waves at different stages throughout our sleep cycle and, of course, ones that look different when we are awake. Unfortunately, EEGs only take recordings from the surface of the brain known as the cortex, but an important area involved with sleep is deep within the brain, known as the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is also known as the body's thermostat. 
That's because of how it's involved with our body's natural state of homeostasis or equilibrium. In fact, the hypothalamus is involved with our basic needs such as thirst, hunger, temperature, and of course, sleep. When we are awake, the lateral hypothalamus is releasing a neuropeptide known as orexin all throughout the cortex and activating the cortex, which is why we are conscious and awake. At the same time, the medial preoptic area and a nuclei called the tuberal mammillary nucleus is releasing GABA onto the ventral lateral preoptic area, inhibiting it. So, the region of the hypothalamus responsible for wakefulness is exciting the rest of our cortex, and at the same time, we have two areas inhibiting the region of the hypothalamus that causes us to fall asleep. As confusing as this may seem, basically what you need to know is that there's an area inside your brain that causes the rest of your body and your mind to feel tired. There's also an area that's responsible for wakefulness, and when this area is active, it inhibits the area that causes us to feel drowsy. So if we're inhibiting the area that causes us to feel drowsy, we don't feel drowsy, and so we feel more awake. These areas are the lateral hypothalamus, which is in charge of keeping us awake, and the ventral lateral preoptic area, which is in charge of making us feel drowsy. So each day, we go through these cycles of high energy and low energy, and we are driven to sleep in a sort of 24-hour period. The reason this happens is because we begin to build up adenosine molecules, and these adenosine molecules make us feel tired, so we sleep to recover. Adenosine comes from ATP, which is a high-energy molecule in our body. When we cleave ATP, it releases energy, and thus we can go on with our everyday functioning. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate, and so after the three phosphates are cleaved off, it's just adenosine. And high adenosine already, we said, is associated with our sleep drive. So lots of adenosine makes us want to sleep. Throughout the day, of course, we accumulate these adenosine molecules, which, of course, makes us tired. The adenosine molecules block and inhibit the activity of the cortex. These molecules are released from an area known as the basal forebrain to the different areas of the cortex, and this is why we feel tired as the day progresses. So the way this actually works is that the basal forebrain is releasing this adenosine onto the medial preoptic area. Thus, the ventral lateral preoptic area is now released from its previous inhibition. This allows it to release GABA onto the areas of the cortex and also the lateral hypothalamus. Since the cortex is responsible for higher order thinking and consciousness, its inhibition with GABA will cause us to lose consciousness, in a sense, which leads us to feeling sleepy. Having established all that, the way that caffeine comes into play is, if you recall, caffeine has its similar structure to adenosine. Because of their similar structure, caffeine is able to bind to adenosine receptors just like adenosine, in fact blocking adenosine from binding further. Think of the receptors as parking spaces in a parking lot per se. Normally, adenosine can take up these spaces, but when we drink coffee, now caffeine takes up the spots, and there's no parking spots left for adenosine. When a molecule blocks another molecule from binding to a receptor, we call them an antagonist. And so, caffeine is an adenosine antagonist. If we have caffeine binding the adenosine receptors, we're preventing the ventrolateral preoptic areas release from inhibition. Now, of course, caffeine doesn't stay in our body indefinitely. These enzymes, called CYP enzymes from our liver, eventually break down the caffeine freeing up space for adenosine to bind once again, and so we feel tired. In fact, this is why two to five hours later, most of us experience a crash coming off of caffeine. In fact, in the long term, most of us lose our sensitivity to caffeine. The reason for this is that over time, our body will upregulate the amount of adenosine receptors we have. 
In addition to increasing receptor density, we also experience an increase in the CYP enzymes, which causes us to decrease our sensitivity to caffeine. Because the first time you had coffee, the caffeine could bind to every adenosine receptor, but later on, now you still have receptors available to adenosine and you still feel tired. This is why the first time you ever had coffee, one cup made you feel wide awake, but now you need several just to keep you going. And while caffeine mainly acts on adenosine receptors, it also stimulates dopamine release and norepinephrine release. Dopamine is sometimes called the feel-good hormone, so it makes us feel happy, and without it, we crave coffee, which gives coffee its addictive properties. Norepinephrine, on the other hand, is from our sympathetic nervous system. It's what's responsible for symptoms such as the shakes, as well as increased heart rate, and even vasodilation or widening of the blood vessels. These are all due to the fight or flight response caused by the sympathetic nervous system. Again, thanks for watching this video brought to you by NeuroPsyQ. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe, of course, and turn on notifications so that you can be up to date and increase your NeuroPsyQ.